I have the easiest task. I remember, as a student, I used to attend Nani Palkhiwala's lectures on budget. On one of these speeches, Mr. Vijay Merchant was the president of that lecture, and he was supposed to introduce Nani Palkhiwala. He came onto the dais, and in his popular voice, he said, "Nani needs no introduction," and he sat down. I should be doing that, saying that our friend, who is back home, Justice Dhananjay Chandrachud, needs no introduction, not only to this gathering, but to any gathering in the world, in the legal circle. But I cannot avoid temptation of speaking about Justice Chandrachud. I remember seeing Justice Chandrachud for the first time outside court number six when, at nine o'clock. we used to park our cars and he had a very famous the only perhaps only ambassador car in the high court compound the green color ambassador car which was the outside court number 6 was the announcement of justice chandrachud then dhananjay chandrachud's arrival in the high court justice chandrachud has authored several important judgments as a judge of not only this court but now as supreme court i would mention only one judgment which he has authored as a judge of bombay high court which was in relation to environmental issues relating to environment impact assessment notification relating to a power project we lost that matter here the matter was taken to supreme court the appeal was before justice aftab alam after some time arguments were heard justice aftab alam said that we have no heart to interfere with such a well poetically written judgment on environmental issues and the slp was dismissed but as a judge of the supreme court his judgments range into variety of subjects those judgments i'll mention but before that i must mention that justice chandrachud apart from being a very very accomplished lawyer and now a judge has been an erudite scholar and truly an ambidextrous person which is in sanskrit called sabyasachi who can shoot from both the hands with equal finesse justice chandrachud has done his llb from delhi university masters and doctor and doctorate of juridical sciences from harvard and he has honorary lld degree from ram manohar lohia national law university in addition to this he has the teaching stints at oklahoma university and mumbai university and honorary editorship of law review of government law college he is prolific writer he was a co-editor of the book which was brought out on the sesquicentenary of the bombay high court called the heritage of judging the bombay high court through 150 years and that book shows the journey of 150 years but apart from the history of high court what you see is imprint of justice dhananjay chandrachud on that book he has also been director of maharashtra judicial academy which looks after the training of judges from subordinate courts as a judge of supreme court he has written innumerable judgments which i cannot mention at this place for want of time i will mention only three judgments and those judgments are the dissenting judgments which will i am certain one day will be the law of the land in entry tax valid uh, the validity of entry tax laws a bench of nine judges justice chandrachud's erudition and the and the and the regard and respect for principles and traditions came out in his dissenting judgment where he confirmed the previous judgments in automobile case and the atiya bari case the old judgments under article 301 of the constitution of india the second judgment i must mention is the judgment in aadhar case and the third judgment i must mention is the judgment in relation to freedom of speech and expression and i quote from his judgment on freedom of speech and expression he said freedom of speech and expression is elan vital of sustenance of all other rights and is seed for germinating democratic views plurality of voices 
celebrated constitutional ideas of liberal democracy and should not be suppressed. Intolerance arising out of dogmatic mindset has chilling effect on freedom of thought and expression. Now, I'm certain these are the resonating words which will be seen and the judgment would perhaps one day become the majority judgment. His justice-oriented approach at times, even trading on unbeaten path, follows Lord Atkins' dictum, which he said, finality is good, but justice is better. That's the approach Justice Chandra should adopts in all his judgments. He is known as one of the best and brilliant writers of the judgment. When he was in Bombay High Court, when we argue a case before him, he would take down his notes in a very, very short, like short letters. And thereafter, he would dictate the judgment in open court. And we would feel that we probably has, have argued this case in such a good manner, which of course was his erudition and not the erudition of our arguments. So he would make you feel that you have argued that case in an extremely wet manner. That is his judgment writing skill. I think I can say with certainty that arguably he is the best writer of judgments today in the country. We are fortunate to have Dhananjay Chandra Trude with us this evening to deliver the KT Desai Memorial Lecture on a subject very dear to him, why the Constitution matters. And as I said earlier, who else to deliver subject on that subject? We are all anxious to hear Justice Chandra Chud. I once again welcome Justice Chandra Chud in our midst. Welcome home. Thank you. Dr. Chandra Chud. Please be careful of the steps. Thank you, Dr. Sate, for those very noble and kind words. Chief Justice of the Bombay High Court, Justice Naresh Patil, my distinguished brother and sister judges of the Bombay High Court, Chief Justice S.P. Bharucha, former Chief Justice of India, Justice Sujata Manohar, Mr. Vasant Manohar and members of the family, distinguished former judges of the Supreme Court, Justice Sam Varyavar, Justice Hemant Gokhale, Chief Justice Mohit Shah, Chief Justice Shavak Swajivdar, Mr. Milin Sathe, Mr. Rajiv Patil, former judges of the Bombay High Court, distinguished senior advocates and members of the bar, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honor for me to address this August gathering this evening at the Justice Katie Desai Memorial Lecture, not just because this is my parent court and some of my most treasured moments associated with the profession have been in these premises, but also because this lecture has been organized in the memory of an individual whose contributions to public life provide a beacon to judges and lawyers who continue in that tradition. Justice Desai, Kantibai as he was fondly called, was born in mid 1903 in Mumbai. He cleared two really difficult examinations the solicitors and the advocate on the original side in 1928 and 1930, a rare achievement in those times. He practiced on the original side of the Bombay High Court and was considered an eminent draftsman. Invited to the bench by Chief Justice Chagla, Justice Desai accepted judgeship with the knowledge that he had only six years at the bench, leaving a lucrative practice at the bar. In those days, to be invited by Chief Justice Chagla was itself a distinction. Judges of his genre placed the fundamentals of commercial law on a sure foundation in Mumbai and beyond. <laughs> Justice Desai's daughter, Justice Sujata Manohar, has carried forward his legacy in public service, having been appointed the first female judge of the Bombay High Court, as well as its first female Chief Justice. She was subsequently elevated to the Supreme Court, a court which she served with distinction 
independence, and an unwavering sense of personal integrity. Ma'am, you've invited me to deliver this lecture, but it's a tall order to do so in the presence of Chief Justice Bharucha and your presence. Uh, I've appeared before both of you in this very court on numerous occasions. I'd only like to begin with two little personal anecdotes. Justice Tarosh Kapadia had become a, a judge of the Bombay High Court. It was 92. And he used to appear for a very leading public sector corporation. I used to appear as his junior. After his elevation, the time came to test me whether I would be able to continue the mantle of that brief. And we were appearing before a division bench of the Bombay High Court in this very court, presided over by Justice Sujata Manohar. I was opposed by Mr. K. K. Singhvi, the doyen of the labor bar, and the bar in general. At the end of a very long argument, Justice Manohar, with her characteristic nod of the head, said, rule, but no interim relief. The words, no interim relief, were music to the words, to music to the ears of my clients, which meant that I got that brief for the next 10 years before I was appointed as a judge, I think, in 2000. And speaking of Justice Bharucha, I appeared here when he was presiding over the court as a judge in charge of notices of motion. My arguments were, were proceeding in an even tenor when the instructing advocate said something to me, and I blurted it out to the court. And Justice Bharucha looked at me very sternly and said, you are not his master's voice. What happened to the rest of my argument is now a very blurred memory because a junior normally shakes when something like that is shown to him or her. But I think we, we cut our teeth, we learned our first faltering steps in the shadow of these two great judges. And one of the reasons why I have prepared a speech contrary to my own instinct to deliver an extempo speech is because I'm quite overwhelmed by the importance of this occasion. I'm extremely grateful to Justice Sujata Manohar for inviting me to speak today on a subject which is close to my heart, the Indian Constitution. Although it does give me some leeway to conclude, or at least put forth an adverse view, that constitutions do not, or perhaps may not matter, doing that would firstly have us confronting the perils of the collapse of our constitutional democracy, and secondly, for me, the peril of being out of my own job. So let me begin by stating which side of the line I stand. Our constitution does matter. The Indian constitutional project did not commence on 9 December 1946 when the Constituent Assembly sat in New Delhi for its first session. It first echoed in the battlefields of Bengal in the 1857 rebellion. Lokmanya Bhagangadhar Tilak whose famous trial took place in this courtroom, was among the first to call for Purna Swaraj. For many decades prior to the coming into the force of our constitution, the Indian self-rule movement was a mass movement and encompassed many sections of society. The call was simple, a governing document of the people, by the people, and for the people. The constitutional culture in India predated the coming into force of our constitution. Before the advent of our constitution, a well-known demand had emerged to establish through the participation of the people basic rules and principles of behavior which would constitute universally binding legal norms. The constitution was to mark a transfer of the power to steward the destinies of its citizens. So the first important facet of the Constitution, which I want to emphasize, that this is a document which marks the transfer of colonial power. The Constitution was to put in place an organic structure that would sustain the country's independence and freedom, equipped with the tools for social revolution, as noted historian Granville Austin called it. So a parallel movement was taking place during the times of the freedom movement, which we shouldn't lose sight of. The parallel movement, together with the movement for freedom, was a movement for social emancipation. The movement which was begun by people like Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, but even before Baba Sahib Ambedkar, by people like Fule. This potential of a constitutional document in steering the course of the society it governs lends it paramountcy in comparison to statute law. A quote, a quote by Carl Schmitt comes to mind. The essence of the Constitution, he says, 
is not contained in a statute or a norm, but in a prior and fundamental political decision by the bearer of the constitution-making power. In a democracy, this is a decision by the people. A constitutional culture is based on the understanding that a constitution unifies a population beyond those in one's immediate sphere of acquaintance, and that whatever be our differences, this is something we have in common. When the constitution was adopted, there was a consciousness that in writing its text, India was finding a way to resolve major substantive debates and disputes over norms and values. In granting people power over their destiny, the constitution placed the individual at its heart to guide the functioning of the democratic institutions which it has put in place. Our history of constitutional drafting is replete with anecdotes which illustrate that there was an attempt by the framers to stake ownership over that document. Our framers did not place the constitution for approval before the British Parliament. Following the Irish precedent, Article 395 of the Constitution repealed the Indian Independence Act. The framers repudiated the source which authorized them to enact the Constitution. This was a symbolic denial of Indian independence being a benevolence of an imperial parliament. These actions of the framers ensured that the chain of constitutional validity did not extend to the crown in parliament. They delivered a completely, pardon my long word, they delivered a completely autochthonous constitution, a homegrown constitution rooted in our soil. The constitution owed its validity and authority to its own people rather than to the fact of its enactment by a foreign legal process. In way fashion, we the people, through the members of the Constituent Assembly, came to be the source of authority of the constitution rather than the Indian Independence Act enacted by the British Crown and Parliament. The advent of the Indian Constitution thus marked the coming together of a population, the culmination of a desire for self-governance. It represented a bottom-up approach where the people granted to themselves their structures of governance. In Nani Palkiwala's words, the Constitution represents the charter of power granted by liberty and not the charter of liberty granted by power. Liberty is not a gift of the state to the people. It is the people enjoying liberty as citizens of a free republic who have granted power to the legislature and to the executive. The constitution was required to take into account multiple conflicts. Let us understand that this is a constitution which is founded in a history of multiple conflicts. Freedom of expression and national integrity, personal, in, personal liberty and political stability, special treatment for some segments of society and equality for all, property rights and social revolutionary needs. The people who work, the people who work the constitution may go terribly wrong and sometimes they do as when we jail a cartoonist for sedition, or when jail instead of bail is given to a blogger who is critical of our religious architecture. When a mob lynches a person for the food that she or he eats, it is the constitution which is lynched. When we deny to human beings the power of love for reasons of religion or caste, it is a constitution which is made to weep. That is exactly what happened yesterday when a groom belonging to the Dalit community was asked to climb down from a horse in a wedding profession. Let us make no two bones about it. That is the constitution which weeps when we read of such incidents. To the wisdom of our people, the constitution trusts. The trust is broken at our peril. The most fundamental struggle was between parliament and the Supreme Court over custody of the constitution. The central issue being whether Parliament's power of amendment was complete and unrestrained. In the initial decade of the Indians, of the Indian independence, of the nation's independence, a stronger central government with far-reaching powers had assumed importance 
in order to drive socio-political revolution, the birth of the nation was into what Granville Austin has described an emergency. Two decisions immediately fueled a change in the Constitution. The decision of the Supreme Court in Ramesh Thapar versus State of Madras, striking down the Madras Maintenance of Public Order Act, 1949, and Bridge Bhushan versus State of Delhi, striking down the East Punjab Public Safety Act, immediately prompted the need to insert the word reasonable in Article 19.2, as well as new grounds of public order, friendly relations with foreign states, and incitement to an offense in order to allow the state to regulate free speech. One other article into the Constitution reflected the center's concern to centralize power through the Constitution and enact property legislation. By the First Amendment, Article 31A and 31B were also added to the Constitution, which expressly saved laws providing for the acquisition of estates from being void on the ground that they are inconsistent with fundamental rights. Acts and regulations specified in the Ninth Schedule would be immune from the operation of Article 13. In keeping with the tense atmosphere into which India was born, the operation of the preventive detention law brought into focus a jurisprudential position by the Supreme Court, which was deferential to the state. This was clearest in A.K. Gopalan versus State of Madras, where the majority held that Article 22, being a complete code relating to the preventive detention law, the validity of an order of detention must be determined strictly according to the terms and within the four corners of Article 22, and that its validity cannot be tested against Article 19 and 21. In other words, the fact that the fundamental rights were not a continuous stretch of entitlements, but isolated pockets of discrete rights was the jurisprudence of our court or the Supreme Court at that time. So the working of the Constitution in the first decade of its existence in the context of a newly born nation looking to consolidate national unity was characterized by deference to the state agenda. But to the exigencies of time, the Constitution adapted and endured. A developing body of comparative constitutional studies studying the resilience of constitutions has indicated that there are three features, three features that exert an overwhelming bearing on their endurance. The first is inclusiveness of the constitution. The second is its specificity. And the third, its flexibility. Our Constitution serves as an outstanding example of durability, in no small part due to the formal power of constitutional amendment granted to Parliament in Article 368. The power of amendment is the foremost expression of flexibility and has been exercised to reflect the march of time and the evolving needs and values of society. It indicates, above all else, the ability of the Constitution to adapt to changing circumstances. Since the enactment of the Constitution in 1950, Article 368 has been used extensively. As of October 2018, there have been more than 100 amendments to the Constitution, with amendments both frequent and wide-ranging. However, the flexibility of our Constitution is balanced by the need to protect the Constitution's character as a supreme law, insulated from the whims of the government of the day. This was achieved by virtue of the basic structure doctrine in Keshwanand and the jurisprudence of the Supreme Court that followed, which placed limits on the plenary amending power of Parliament, thus safeguarding principles that form the bedrock of our constitutional order. As a result, the procedure for amendment today is reflective of a finely struck balance. It is neither too rigid nor too flexible, blending pragmatism and adaptability with carefully designed safeguards. Indian constitutional history has borne witness to a number of landmark constitutional amendments. What was formerly the fundamental right to property enjoys the unique distinction of being the most amended provision in our constitution. Protected as a fundamental right until the passage of the 44th Amendment in 1978, the right to property was thereafter deprived of its fundamental status to reflect the growing realities of a conflict between the protection of existing property rights and the desire to move towards a more egalitarian society, which would involve a redistribution of land. The 61st Constitutional Amendment of 1989 
passed in recognition of political consciousness of the country's youth and the desire to integrate them into the political process, reduced the voting age from 21 to 18 for elections to the Lok Sabha and to the state legislative assemblies. The 73rd and 74th amendments, which brought through the insertion of part nine, a major boost to the protection and recognition of local self-governing models in India by providing a constitutional status to panchayats, namely the rural self-government and municipalities, urban self-government. The 86th Amendment of 2002 recognized the primacy of education for the nation's youth and through the insertion of Article 21A made free and compulsory education between the ages of 6 and 14 a fundamental right and responsibility of the state. So we would miss the essence of the Constitution if we do not remember to dwell upon the institutions which the Constitution has created. Democracy thrives when institutions thrive. And democracies fail, nations fail, when institutions fail. So the resilience of our Constitution lies not merely in placing the individual at the forefront of its endeavors, but in terms of creating vibrant institutions and these are institutions which really sustain our democratic structure. The makers of our constitution were confronted with various tensions which ultimately shaped the character of the constitution. The constitution of India is a text that governs over 1.2 billion people in 29 states, speaking 22 constitutionally recognized languages, not to mention hundreds of dialects and practicing virtually every mainstream religion in the world. Indian constitutionalism has been described as a, bo as a boisterous and contentious enterprise that strives to endow the largest, most diverse and complex democracy with legal form. The sheer diversity of the persons it governs throws up challenges in the nature of religious, cultural, and linguistic differences. Significantly, this diversity has led to contradictions in the Constitution. These contradictions were often in the form of a grant of a different status to a community, identity, or territorial region to preserve the plural social fabric of our nation. Rivaling the importance of a social revolution to be fostered by a transformative Constitution were the goals of national unity and stability, considered as prerequisites for a social renaissance. The framing and working of the Constitution can be described as an attempt to balance the contradictions of a multicultural and multi-ethnic society, which, among other things, involves reconciling a secular state with a fundamentally religious society. Though the word secular state was introduced in the Constitution only in 1976, the secular nature of the Indian state was affirmed by the Constituent Assembly. During the framing of the Indian Constitution, a significant question arose as to whether religious and other groups should have separate and distinct political representation in electoral processes. While the Government of India Act contained provisions for communal representation in electorates, the policy of communal representation was rejected by the minority subcommittee and the advisory committee. Finally, communal representation was done away with by Article 325 of our Constitution. The draft of the Constitution was a declaration of social intent. While rejecting political fragmentation on the basis of religion, the Assembly granted autonomy to religious minorities. The Charter of Fundamental Rights, based on the principle of non-discrimination, begins with Article 15 telling us that it applies to discrimination on the grounds of religion, race, caste, sex, or place of birth. The freedom of religion located within the Charter is expressed in four articles, 25 to 28. The centrality of secularism in the constitutional system was reinforced by the Supreme Court by assigning it in the decision in S.R. Bomai the value of a basic feature of the constitution. Our constitution contains a panoply of instruments for the protection of minorities based on an innovative combination of individual and group rights. The Constitution does not limit minority rights to the recognition and protection of their culture alone, but it also recognizes the right to establish and administer educational institutions of their choice as a corollary of their fundamental freedom. Finally, Articles 350A and B reinforce this right 
but with an ambit limited to linguistic minorities, providing that it shall be the endeavor of every state and of every local authority to provide adequate facilities for instruction in the mother tongue at the primary stage. Our constitution is a multicultural document which provides political and institutional measures for the recognition and accommodation of the country's diversity. In India, cultural and religious minorities are not considered as external elements, but as actors participating in the construction of a common plural identity and as basic elements in the constitutional system. Cultural heterogeneity celebrates precisely those plural values which would seem to contradict the unity required for successful democratic constitutionalism. Another constitutional contradiction which has been addressed is asymmetric federalism. If you see the working of the Constitution right through to the 1970s, you are impressed by the sense of the centralization of power with the center. That has given way post-1990 to a decentralization of power as regional political parties have grown and the aspirations of states have been noticed by the Supreme Court. Similarly, our Constitution recognizes diversity when it provides for special measures for governance in areas inhabited by indigenous communities or the scheduled tribes under the fifth and sixth schedule of the Constitution. These constitutional balances reconcile social, political, and cultural differences. The Constitution embraced these differences. In doing so, it has fostered a heterogeneous cultural and social fabric which recognizes different identities. The multicultural identity of our country is an ode to its strong democratic values which do not compel homogeneity. Homogeneity is an anathema to our constitution. This brings me to the topic of constitutional identity. Constitutional identity encompasses concepts as broad as the features and provisions of the document itself to the relation between the Constitution and the culture in which it operates, and to the relationship between the identity of the Constitution and other relevant identities, such as national, religious, or gender identities. In his seminal book called Constitutional Identity, Gary Jacobson argues that a Constitution acquires, that a constitution acquires an identity through experience from a combination of the aspirations and commitments that express a nation's past and the desire to transcend that past. He acknowledges the complexity of constitutional identity by stating that just like identity is not fixed in the distinctive makeup of the infant who first emerges from the womb, the identity of a constitution is only imperfectly knowable through the provisions promulgated at the time of its adoption. Yet it is the most obvious starting point for commencing an examination of constitutional identity and the first step on the long and winding road from political design for collective identity to a socially embedded institution that actually fosters such identity. <laughs> Modalities of legal subjectivity, identity, and citizenship are rapidly shifting in the context of contemporary globalization. While state nationalism remains a strong force, be it in Trump's America or Erdogan's Turkey, there are concurrently many other modes of connection that are shaping people's sense of personal and collective identities. A range of new legal relations are brought about by new labor markets, new industries and commodities, new forms of secular and religious violence, new cultural and sexual politics, new reproductive technologies, new materialistic understandings of agency, and a rethinking of the autonomous subject citizen with increasing attention being given to a blurring of conventional divides between the human and the non-human. Emerging changes in science and technology pose a challenge to our legal and constitutional values by disrupting conceptions of the very definition of our personhood and of our identity. The burgeoning of multifaceted and intersectional identities accompanied by an acknowledgement of the inherent fluidity of our identities lends immediacy to the need that our constitution must keep pace with them. Increasingly so, 
our constitution is recognizing the diverse identities of our citizens. An important example is the recognition of different gender and sexual identities. While the break from a heteronormative sexual framework has been gradual, courts have played an important role in recognizing the autonomy of individuals within the Constitution to determine their orientation as well as their gender identity. It was my belief while writing the Section 377 judgment that we, in we the people of India, in our preamble, must be an ever-inclusive and expansive we. The we in the we the people of India is not prefixed by only, stating only we or any other such prefix connoting religious, caste, class, sex, or political ideology or ideological affiliation. It is a simple and obvious interpretation. But as George Orwell said, the work of intelligent people is to restate the obvious because the devil is very often in the detail. As people in the field of law, we would agree that the limits of our words are the limits of our world. The shift in our jurisprudence from R.C. Cooper, the bank nationalization case, and from A.K. Gopalan, which held that part three does not seek to enunciate distinct rights, but weaves a pattern of guarantees in a single thread has been crucial. Weaving constitutional rights as overlapping has opened new avenues to the Supreme Court to realize the emancipatory power of the Constitution. This issue presented itself before us in the Sabrimala Temple Entry case. Article 25 protects the equal entitlement of all persons to a freedom of conscience and to freely profess, pro protect, and propagate religion. Article 25 says it is subject to the other provisions of this part. Article 26 does not embody this additional stipulation found in Article 25.1, which subject it to the other provisions of Part 3. But does that by itself lend credence to the theory that the right of a religious denomination to manage its affairs is a standalone right, uncontrolled or unaffected by the other fundamental freedoms? It is the shift in our jurisprudence that grounds Article 26 not as an independent silo, but among a large cluster of freedoms which the Constitution has envisaged as intrinsic to human liberty and dignity. Hence, the dignity of women, which emanates from Article 15 and is a reflection of Article 21, cannot be disassociated from the exercise of religious freedom under Article 26. A conversation within the Constitution between religion, dignity, and morality is aided by such a shift. Our Constitution, above all, is a transformative document. It was to usher in a radical transformation from a colonial regime to a liberal constitutional democracy. It sought to empower the individual who it placed at the very heart of society and polity. The promise of substantive equality in parts three and four was truly revolutionary, for it gave many the language to articulate, voice, and agitate moral indignations. Citizen interpretive practices remain diverse, conflicted, and contradictory. These articulations are a litmus that test the successful functioning of the Constitution. At the heart of the learnings and unlearnings of the Constitution is its basic unit, the individual. We must not, we must not lose sight of the fact that the judiciary comes from the citizenry. The text of our Constitution, while the obvious starting point for interpreting it was not intended to be the end of the interpretive exercise. The subjects of the Constitution, the citizens of our nation, have assumed new and diverse social and political identities since its exception. And the text of the Constitution has embraced these identities. The text is infused with meaning every time the court is called upon to interpret the Constitution. So when the court does take action upon this task, the question is, should it ignore the underlying values of our Constitution? Should it not attempt to ensure that the Constitution is a living document that remains relevant to the needs of a constantly evolving society? Should the court at all overlook the transformative character of the Constitution? Hence, citizen interpretive practices are essential to realizing the democratic ideals of our Constitution. 
PILs characterized by a collaborative approach, procedural flexibility, and judicially supervised interim orders and forward-looking relief serve to bring the people into judicial discourse. The guarantees of the Constitution must be assessed for the social change that they can engender, which depends heavily on the working of institutions. Without a judiciary and without the citizenry, which truly recognizes the transformative potential of the Constitution, our Constitution will remain an empty promise, doing mere lip service to the laudatory goal of achieving egalitarian, liberated society. Professor Upendra Bakshi's view on citizen participation is that constitutions are not arenas of practice of state power. They also provide registers of interpretive practices of an active citizenry. The constitution, if it is to be truly transformational, is so because of the people that work it. The constitution is worked on a daily basis by the courts, by legislators, by citizens, civil society, and the media. The same document can be a charter to destroy human freedom, or it can be a document that pushes society in the direction of recognizing the inherent value of human dignity. As a former US Secretary of State noted, here, the illegal we do immediately, the unconstitutional takes a little longer. The working of the Constitution, in and out of courts, bears an intricate relationship with societal change. It is through the working of the Constitution that we give meaning and therefore life to the Constitution. And by giving life to the Constitution through interpretation, we determine who we are as a people governed by it. Thus, the working of our Constitution has the power to change our lives. The ultimate question must be, what do the words of the text mean in our time? For the genius of the Constitution rests not in any static meaning it might have had in a world that is dead and gone, but in the adaptability of its great principles to cope with current problems and current needs. What the constitutional fundamentals mean to the wisdom of other times cannot be their measure to the visions of our time. Similarly, what those fundamentals mean to us, our descendants will learn, cannot be the measure of the vision for their future. But what of the future of the constitution? What and where lies the future of our Constitution? There are emerging questions which the drafters of our Constitution did not envisage and to which the text of the Constitution provides no clear answers. How do we build in the silences of the Constitution? For instance, technological advances have radically changed how we conduct our lives, interact with people, and communicate ideas. These changes have seeped through how the law governs, how the courts carry out their procedures, and how the state chooses to identify us as citizens. While facilitative and enabling in a manner, these advances have also the potential of disrupting conceptions of basic principles that we have long been familiar with, be it freedom of speech, privacy, the right against self-incrimination, personal liberty, or the very definition of our personhood. As we, as a population, become increasingly adept at using newer forms of technology, the Constitution will have to keep pace to continue being relevant. The rise of technology also raises potential questions of whom personhood can be attributed to. With advancements towards artificial intelligence and robo-mechanics, where do concepts like negligence and tortious liability lie? Constitutional interpretation will again require the courts to mold the text to apply constitutional principles to emerging technologies so that values of security and personal liberty can be protected. The Constitution is a living document, a document for the future. If a Constitution is not framed for the future, it is doomed to fail. The Constitution is not set in stone. Its endurance can be attributed to its dynamism. It moves beyond the narrow understanding of democratization as a quest for universal suffrage and fair elections to a more fluid, real-time construct of competing interests 
negotiate comes stressed and malleable institutions and tumultuous change and views the democratic process as one subject to ongoing interpretation challenge and renewal the drafters of the constitution were prophetic they foresaw that the questions that confront indian society would change over the years however the answers would always be found in the enduring spirit of the constitution to adapt and its effectual working by the people it seeks to govern which is why the constitution matters the ideals laid down long ago still govern us today and are the foundation of what a better future might look like a future that must be effected by us collectively as a democracy and as a people this sentiment is captured by the words of dr ambedkar when he said however good a constitution may be it is sure to turn out bad because those who are called to work it happen to be a bad lot and then baba saheb said however bad a constitution may be it may turn out to be good if those who are called to work it happen to be a good lot the constitution works even if you don't believe in it or even if it doesn't matter to you it has been working all this while an anecdote from the physicist niels bohr's life is what i will end with niels bohr had a guest a, a co-scientist who came to his house and he was surprised at seeing a horseshoe above the door of the physicist country house the fellow scientist exclaimed that he did not share these superstitions and he said you're a physicist how can you be superstitious how can you have a superstitious belief regarding horseshoes keeping evil spirits out of the house to which bohr replied i don't believe in it either i have it there because i was told that it works even when one doesn't believe in it at all and that ladies and gentlemen tells us the story that is why the constitution matters because it works even for those who don't believe in it thank you very much <laughs>